Hi there, Rudyard Griffiths, the host and moderator of the Monk Dialogues. Welcome to this, our final post-dialogue members-only discussion for 2020. Over the course of the year, we've had a variety of conversations with people after all of our main stage uh, Monk Dialogues, really focusing on uh, providing a Canadian perspective on the issues that we've been tackling as a regular guide to uh, this program, uh, to me personally, and to, uh, I think helping all of us uh, think through the big issues and ideas that have been raised in this program, we've been exceedingly fortunate to have Janice Gross-Stein. She's a professor of conflict management at the University of Toronto, a founding director of the Monk School of Global Affairs, a internationally best-selling author, Massey lecturer, the list goes on. Janice, great to have this opportunity for a final kind of debrief for 2020. And what I thought we would do is go back through the last 10 shows, the episodes that uh, kicked off our, our second season, so to speak, uh, this fall, and pick up uh, some of the key clips uh, that reflect, I think, the most interesting ideas that have surfaced uh, in, in these conversations. Uh, are you up for the mission? <laughs> I sure am. And, you know, it, it is really interesting, Rick, you're the, uh, for the mission that we started and we were uh, deep in gloom, I think, by the time we come to the end of these 10 dialogues, there's some rays of hope. There certainly are. Well, let's go back now and uh, start with Maggie Haberman, a New York Times uh, reporter, really um, kind of a horse whisperer for the public when it came to understanding President Trump. She kicked off our fall 2020 Monk Dialogues. And uh, from this clip, I uh, want you to react to it. I think she had a really interesting insight about the psychology and temperament of this president, which has kind of played out uh, in the post-election, post-U.S. election period. Let's have a listen now to Maggie Haberman. If you look at this through the lens of whether Donald Trump is really going to do anything he can to cling to power, which is the statement that gets said over and over again, I don't happen to share that view. I think that Donald Trump is very good at redefining what his idea of winning is, I think there's a real question about how much longer Donald Trump actually wants to do this job because I don't think he is enjoying it. I, think, I don't think he's enjoyed it for a very long time. I think he likes being, I think he likes the title president. He likes, I mean, I'll give you a for instance. I once asked a friend of his in 2017 if the president was liking the job. And the friend said, oh, absolutely. And I said, what about it? And they said, oh, you know, Air Force One, Air Force Two, Marine One. I mean, he likes, I think, the trappings that come with it. I don't think the day to day is something that he is particularly built for. So Janice, now some people would say, well, you know, he is fighting to stay on, but I think there's a more interesting subtext here that his fight post-election to stay on isn't really about staying on as president. He knows that ship has sailed. It's about creating the preconditions for him with his base and maybe with him in his own kind of unique mind to think that he didn't lose, that he's not the loser. Do you agree that Maggie Haberman was on to something really important and prescient in that uh, quote? Well, did she get that right, Rudyard, at a time when I think uh, most listeners were very dubious and were actually predicting violence in the United States? Um, she got him. Uh, as she got the fact that what he abhors more than anything else is that label loser, uh, that he would move on, he would never acknowledge that he's lost, he hasn't done that. He may be even small-minded enough not to go to the inauguration. Uh, you know, there have only been three other presidents in, UN, in U.S. history who have done that. But that he really is positioning himself uh, and has been for after the White House, what he does uh, with the enormous following that he has, with the 70 million voters that uh, support him, and how I think he monetizes that going forward, that is going to be an issue for him, and whether he runs again and keeps tight control of the Republican Party. So she, Maggie, was one of the few who got this right. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that, Janice. There are reports that since the election, on the basis of his kind of very public griping about a supposed, you know, stolen ballots and stuffed ballots, that 
some sources reporting he may have raised close to a quarter of a billion dollars for a PAC, which is a kind of political action committee, which really allows unrestricted political spending. What do you make of that? I mean, it certainly sounds like this is not uh, a kind of exit stage left for Donald Trump. What does it mean for the Republican Party? And, you know, what are the dangers here, the risks that this is a guy who's, if he's not running again, he's certainly going to be a political force to be reckoned with for the foreseeable future? Well, that didn't really, in effect, Rudyard, what he's signaling. Uh, you know, that is an astonishing amount of money for an exiting president to raise. He still has a very tight grip on the Republican Party. You know, as it's becoming obvious that there is zero possibility for a legal challenge to the election results, we've seen some movement, especially at the state level, or at state level you know, state legislators, Republican governors who have moved away. But he still has a grip uh, on the party, on the fundamental institutions of that party. And my hunch, he's not going to let that go. Uh, he will be a factor. He will shape the nomination race for the Republican nomination next time around. There are many people who will not run uh, until and unless he makes it clear that he will not run again. And it's entirely conceivable that he will run again, uh, even though he may not want the job. So he is a political force on, in, in, on the landscape of US politics. He's not going away. Okay, Janice, uh, sobering words. Let's go to our, our next clip. This was uh, James Carville, uh, one of America's kind of legendary political strategists, just a week out from the US election kind of making an appeal about the importance of the vote, the importance of the size of what he was hoping then would be a, a blue wave, a, a strong showing by the Biden presidency. Let's hear James Carville and then I, I wanna have you react to it. I'm hopeful that things are breaking the Democrats way and we can eradicate this just awful, God awful, and just humiliating, embarrassing moment that the United States is going through. It, 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 it's, I'm just really torn up about it. Uh, I've worked in, as you point out, I've worked in 22 different countries. And literally every place that I've gone, uh, you know, people like the United States. I mean, I think we are kind of big and sometimes, you know, clumsy and, you know, can be full of ourselves, but basically like what our country is and what it stands for. And then we had this. So, uh, I'm not very shy about my opinions of what's happening to my country, but I, I think that we're on the verge of a real breakthrough here. I, I, I think our darkest hour is going to turn into our finest hour. I really do. So, Janice, that big breakthrough didn't happen. In fact, no. Trump surprised, uh, surprised with a lot of minority voters. Um, sh the Republican Party enjoyed significant down-ballot support. In fact, uh, you know, thwarting Nancy Pelosi's hopes of adding seats uh, in the House of Representatives. Where does America come out of this election? You know, is it still reputationally kind of damaged internationally by this? Do you think the cup's half empty, half full? What's, what's your take on the impact, the legacy of this election? It's probably half full, but it's certainly not as full as James Carl would have liked, right? It's helpful because there was a really um, serious uh, and prolonged challenge to the institutions of the United States, and they helped. Uh, and I think that's an important point to make. Uh, and that sometimes gets lost in all the noise, but those institutions really help. And even you know, Republican governors in, in those swing states where Trump uh, Trump's legal team made uh, a challenge after challenge, came out and dismissed the validity of it and said this, there was no fraud. So on the core, core principle of a democracy, which is, you know, fair and free elections, the institutions help, and that's encouraging. Um, and, the, and there, James, is right, the cup is half full. Where the cup is half empty, and I think for an experienced 
and he really is, you know, one of the most experienced political hands in the United States. Where he got it wrong, and this tells us something about the future too, Roger, where he got it wrong, he underestimated the appeal that Trump-like populism has in the United States right now. Uh, it's interesting. They did not want Trump, but they did not want uh, a blue wave. And we are, the United States, more so than other countries, but not alone, confronts the growing divide um, in democratic societies, this huge gap, which uh, we've all seen, COVID has made that so clear. Probably the biggest single challenge for the Biden administration. Can he narrow that gap over the next two or three years? Because if he doesn't, um, it won't be echoes of Trump. It'll be something much more. Hmm. Janice, for, you know, for Canadians who care about issues like climate change, uh, international cooperation, uh, you can think of a range of issues, uh, you know, less tariffs on, China, on Canadian uh, goods. For sure. Trump's down ballot strength here suggests, as some people have argued post-election, that this is still inherently a country that has a conservative view, a conservative kind of orientation towards the world that, as you say, has these populist kind of elements and coloring, but it's not seemingly a country that's ready, as you say, for a big Green New Deal or some yeah. substantial reworking of, of uh, taxes and, and uh, balance of payment to those at need versus those in the proverbial 1%. Is that the right, is that a reading, a valid reading to take out of the election? And maybe how does that affect Canadian expectations? You know, I would, I would read it just a little differently, Roger, with, with some really important implications for Canada. When we actually look at public opinion polling in the United States, 75 to 80% support international institutions, 75 to 80% support international trade. So the, the internationalist agenda that Biden is going to return to the White House now. And look at his team. Uh, they are virtually all Clinton Obama people, with, with, with uh, largely women are the exception to that. He has really uh, put teams of very accomplished women in place. But these, the, they, this team will follow an agenda that is very congenial, international to a Canadian government. It's going to be a much easier ride internationally for us. But what it, where we make a mistake the division you're talking about is internal um, on, inside the United States. It is all about access to jobs. It is all about a better distribution of income. It is all about, um, you know, deaths of despair in the United States. It is all about distrust of U.S. institutions by an alarmingly large percentage of the population. So Biden, unlike other presidents, will have to pay attention to what is going on inside the United States. And the big difference, and here this will matter to Canada, this is not the United States of John F. Kennedy willing to bear any burden uh, for the democratic world. The United States doesn't have the attention span and the resources to do that over these next four years. Fascinating stuff. Okay, well, let's shift to our dialogues that we had after uh, the U.S. election. So our focus really was to explore in those five programs the, the kind of pressures, the fractures, the stress lines uh, affecting liberal democracy. And we started out uh, also with a focus on international voices, so getting outside of North America to get a global perspective. Our first uh, guest in that uh, vein was Martin Wolf, uh, kind of lead columnist for the Financial Times of London. Let's have a listen to him now, and then uh, we'll get you to react. Democracies just aren't very good at governing because the people don't trust them. They don't have very effective government systems. So I think what's emerged from this, and this is very important, I think, as a part of the reaction to the era starting the 1980s when we had to, you know, I always use this quote from Ronald Reagan who said, uh, the nine most da dangerous languages, dangerous words in the English language 
are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. This is a famous watchword of Reagan's. And for three decades, that sort of was a dominant idea. What the financial crisis in this has shown is actually we need governments. We want governments. And if democracies don't provide them, um, then, of course, people will be tempted to go for effective autocrats. And effective autocrats, in some ways, are much more frightening than ineffective ones. So, Janice, I, I think that's a really important point that Martin's making here, that the threat to liberal democracy isn't from these kind of incompetent autocrats like um, Viktor Orban or Vladimir Putin or, you know, possibly the likes of Donald Trump, depending where your politics lie. It's really from a regime like China, which can, shows how an effective autocrat can take an immensely complicated, multifaceted problem like a pandemic and effectively eradicate it in a matter of weeks, reopening its economy, ensuring uh, prosperity, and uh, doing so at minimal uh, fiscal and monetary cost as compared to Western democracies. What's your take on that insight? You know, what a smart comment by Martin. Um, because he sets the big arc here, Roger, that's starting really in 2008 and certainly exaggerated by the pandemic. People understand now they need government. Uh, so this, he demarcates, and he's so right, the end of the Reagan-Thatcher era. That era is over all over the world. Uh, and, but then he goes on and makes this interesting comment. Well, if democracies can't do this in an efficient way, where efficient autocrats are going to do that. And that is really the story of the Chinese response. You know, their economy is growing again. It's probably the only one that uh, has emerged uh, and is in the post-COVID recovery. You see pictures of Chinese cities. There's no lockdowns. They haven't eradicated the virus, by the way. Uh, there are still recurrent small outbreaks that they're managing, but they are in the coast post-COVID recovery. But how did they do this, Richard? They did this with the most invasive use of technology that we have ever seen. And they were going down that road beforehand. They had social credit scores, where you know, if you crossed against the traffic light, uh, cameras would pick it up, use spatial identification, uh, identify you, Roger, and you would have a a uh, demerit point on your social credit score. And if you got past a certain point, couldn't travel, uh, a whole series of consequences. You know, during COVID, how did they do this? They physically locked people in their houses, padlocked doors, delivered food to the front door, would wait till it opened, put the padlock back on. So yes, there is an efficiency that allowed them to recover that way. But this is a price that no democratic society is going to pay. And coming out at the other end, there is a price that efficient autocracies play. They are very rarely uh, on the leading edge of the innovation curve. They're very rarely on the edge of the adaptation curve as well. And what you see, and Ms. Martin didn't talk about, what you see in China is a persistent level of fear now, uh, arrest of dissidents, arrest of critics. The space is narrowing all the time. Ultimately, um, in history, that has proven a curse uh, for leaders who get shut off from critical information that they need and do less and less well over time. So mm. I disagree with him there. Mm. I mean, two quick counterpoints. One, I think China just announced this week a quantum computer uh, processing at multiple speeds faster than uh, Google's system, which at this point was yeah. the fastest system in the West. So I'm not so sure they're all that far behind uh, in the technological curve. And I guess what, what worries you know, me more, though, Janice, just to make this point, worries me more, though, is the the kind of corrosive effect that the China example in the COVID world just has about our own sense of certainty in our system. I mean, I think we all agree that we don't want to be hubristic about liberal democracy. We don't necessarily want to assume that its values are universal values that should be uh, you know, foisted on everyone. But at the same time, you need to believe what you believe in. And, and I, I worry in my casual conversations, maybe you've had these too, 
over the last you know, nine months that people are starting to question. They're starting to wonder, well, why do we put up with all of these kind of, you could think somewhat bizarre trappings of liberal democracy? You know, why is the, the minister of industry some MP from a riding in the middle of, you know, wherever in Canada? Like, why is that person qualified to be the head of our industrial policy in Canada? The Chinese would never make that, that type of decision. No, they would not. And you're right that, by the way, just to round up that argument, you're right, Rudyard, that in science and technology and engineering and medicine, what we call STEM, the Chinese system competes extremely well. But we also know that in every one of those fields, and to take a concrete example, vaccination, right? That is not only a, a STEM problem, that is just as much a social problem. And that's where systems that are so tightly coiled do less well. Now take, you know, take um, our, our own confidence in our, you know, democratic societies. There's always a balance here, right? We roll our eyes in frustration at some of the inefficiencies and frankly, the stupidities we see in our society. And eventually that pressure builds up on government and they tighten up and they perform better, but then they tighten up too much and the, the pressure grows. So what democratic society in a deep sense is all about is just calibrating back and forth, toggling back and forth between how efficient they have to be and how open they have to be. And that's healthy. That is a healthy conversation, which over time just consistently does better, Roger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, fair enough. I just think delivering economic growth and opportunity and optimism for the future is a, a big test yeah. for any political si system and, and liberal democracies have not done a great job for that for, for going on uh, a, a decade. But, a decade, yeah. Um, yeah. So that's but, key. You know, we had a forward. very bad decade in the 70s, right? That's true. We had stagflation and there was, all, there was despair about the future of democracy. And then we had the 80s, the 90s, and the, and the first part of mm -hmm. the first decade of this century until the global financial crisis. So in, why can our institutions adjust? And it's much harder in an efficient autocracy because we get critical feedback. Yeah. Well, let's hope our political class is up to the task of a post-COVID world uh, in the liberal democratic West. Let's go to our next question, because again, it was on the topic of, uh, our next clip, sorry, uh, it was on the topic of democracy, and it was Ann Applebaum, who gave a really, yeah. I think, interesting analysis of the, the challenges to liberal democracy, both pre-COVID, but also how this pandemic has affected them. This is a clip, uh, her views on kind of social media and its effect on democracy, which I know Janice is a, a topic of great intellectual interest for you. So let's have that clip and then uh, we'll get you to uh, comment. I am really interested in the question of, um, it's not so much social media regulation, but internet regulation um, and um, that can be done not just in the United States, but in conjunction with other democracies that would look very deeply at the question of what do we want a democratic internet to look like? So we, we know already um, what the autocratic internet looks like because China has created it. We mm -hmm. know what the Chinese have done. They've, they've used all the technologies, the nudging, the, um, the, 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 the manipulation, and they've used it to create a, a, a Chinese internet um, which gives the government more control and a more ability to monitor the population. What do we want the liberal democratic internet to look like? We've never really had that conversation. Um, we've let it be determined by private companies, um, by some, you know, historical accident. Um, and we haven't, you know, we haven't thought as societies what we want to do about it. So Janice, this has been a common theme in these dialogues all year long. The need for us in some serious way to think about how as citizens in a democracy, we govern social media, yeah. not how social media manipulates, prods, affects uh, uh, us. How do we take control? It's great to you know, share that understanding, express it, but what the heck are we doing about it? It seems like absolutely nothing. Oh, so I agree with you and I agree with Anne. Uh, she put an absolutely essential subject on the agenda there. She's 
I completely agree with her, and I agree with you, Roger. We're doing nothing thus far about it, and we know all the problems. Um, we know how the, the, you know, even the populists have been able to exploit uh, media platforms to create echo chambers, which actually magnify their their message. And the future of democracy in many deep ways is being fought out on social media. So what can we do about that? So there's two agendas here. There's an economic agenda that we have such dominance at the top among five or six or seven companies, depending on how you count, that they are making it impossible for competitors uh, to go up under them. In fact, they're buying them out. Uh, and it's actually consolidating uh, and making competition even harder. There are traditional remedies here, which you know very well, antitrust policy, competition policy, but it's actually very tough to do. They tried it 20 years ago against Microsoft uh, and breaking up big behemoth companies into their component parts is hard to do, but that doesn't mean that there's just not a series of intermediate arrangements along the way where we stop these big companies from buying up smaller competitors as they are moving up. For instance, is it okay for Facebook to buy Instagram? Not clear, right? And we don't have a problem, for example, in preventing Chinese companies coming into our markets and buying up companies that are critical to our infrastructure. And governments manage to get their head around that. So Anne is right to put this next piece, the economic challenge, that um, is, is obvious to anybody looking at the social media landscape. How do we democratize that? How do we enable fair competition going forward? Mm -hmm. The second piece, what are some reasonable rules? <laughs> and this comes to the issue that we've debated in Canada. You know, Ed Greenspan at the Public Policy Forum has been leading a conversation on this. Are these platform companies or are they publishers? And do they bear any responsibility for what people post on their platforms? Yes and no is the answer we've gotten from these companies. And these big companies are now in the business of censorship. Is that okay in a democracy? Or do we in fact need an arm's length regulator that makes some rules about fact checking uh, and, uh, and hate speech that govern what a platform company can allow to go up? This, these are not impossible problems, but governments have to move on this. She is completely right. But Janice, why are we so seemingly passive about it? I mean, we stick, we stick monitors on the smokestacks of all kinds of emitters across Canada, and we know down to the, you know, the micron uh, what's coming out of those stacks and its, its, its effects on the commons. Well, here's a commons. It's a commons yep. called democracy. It's a commons called yep. the public square. Yet we can't even as a sovereign country, Canada, come up with some controls, some limits on, uh, let's face it, the digital pollution that these, yep. albeit very positive technologies in other ways, but the digital pollution that they throw off? Why are we seemingly unable to, to act? I, I agree with you. Government is too, our government is too slow to take this on. You could have made excuses for them two, three years ago when it was not obvious how important digital infrastructure is to the future of this country. It is critically important to the future. Government indirectly funds some of it but it is not stepping up to the challenge, Roger, of putting in place an appropriate legal framework. And ultimately they are done, you know, late to the game, you pay a price. Citizens push you because you don't do it, you pay a price. It's mind boggling to me yeah. that our government hasn't moved on this. Yeah. Mind boggling. Yeah, the Europeans have, they have the, whatever, yes, the they GDRS. Have. They have. Um, now they haven't, you know, what they've done, and it's, I think it's important for Canadians to understand, what the Europeans have done is set a standard for privacy and who owns our data that is much higher. And because global companies don't want to be bothered to reconfigure their platforms and their products uh, in, in each environment into which they move, they're just following European standards. 
that's a first mover advantage. Yeah. Why Canada doesn't step up now? Beyond me. We've been yeah. talking about it for three years. Yeah, well, let's hope something comes out of it. Okay, let's go to our last uh, clip, Janice. It was from uh, Ian Morris, uh, yeah. our kind of penultimate dialogue. Big thinker, a guy who spent a lot he of is. time pouring over the last 15,000 years of recorded human history to try to understand the next hundred. Uh, let's have a listen to him, and, and then we'll, we'll wrap up our conversation. When the U.S. started becoming more successful on the global stage at the end of the 19th century, the U.S. didn't get more Europeanized. Europeans started to worry about becoming Americanized. That sort of lesson in the past suggests maybe rather than China becoming Westernized, the rest of the world is going to become more Easternized. Mm. If China is able to develop an alternative model of success in a very digital, super interlinked global marketplace, that's just different from the marketplaces of the 19th and 20th centuries. And I think on this one, we just don't know how it's going to turn out. Um, your early optimism that China was going to become more democratic, that seems to be fading very quickly uh, over the last 10 years. So, Janice, that kind of pulls together a lot of the threads that we've yeah. just talked about uh, in the last half hour, which is liberal democracy, uh, the rise of China, uh, the post-COVID world. Um, where do you see the global balance of power, the kind of the fulcrum around which history will bend itself for the remainder of this century. Has that moved and, well, and, and with what speed is that it, changing? You know, it has moved. Uh, and I think there are two or three important ideas that kind of out of Ian's comments. Uh, the first is history has moved fast as a result of COVID. Uh, we say all the time, COVID has pushed history forward 10 years. And that is, by the way, what, what Chinese officials tell you over and over again. We thought it was going to take us 30 years to catch up to the United States. We just gained 10 because we did so well. And they, they really, it was shambolic the way the United, let's, let's just call it what it is. It was utterly shambolic the way the United States uh, managed COVID. So the gap between the two societies is narrowed. And there, Ian is totally right. He's also right that Britain did not, we did not become more anglicized. Uh, the United Britain adjusted to the United States, but I think he's wrong in saying that American culture will become more like China and other parts of the world as well, because there's a very big difference. And we don't like to talk about this, but Britain and the United States were both colonizers in their own way. They believed their values were universal, and they, written directly to the United States indirectly, has always tried to export its values and its systems abroad. China doesn't do that. Uh, China um, stays within its lane, but asks those who live on its periphery to pay tribute. And that's, in fact, how the Chinese empire was built. There's almost no discussion, by the way, in China about exporting its system to the rest of the world. It's too busy building roads um, and a digital highway and selling into markets, but it places virtually no emphasis on exporting its values. So yes, we are on the verge of a historic rebalancing between the United States and China, where we will have uh, a, a shared distribution of power in the world coming out of COVID. But it's going to be a world where we're going to coexist with different values, both the Chinese and the West. And it might be just a bit of a sobering moment for the West after 300 years, then maybe its values don't really speak to the rest of the world. And we have enough to do at home to reinforce the values that are at risk here. Mm. Well, Janice, thank you uh, so much. It's been a, just such a pleasure uh, these past months to, to have these conversations uh, with you, to think through these ideas from a Canadian lens, a Canadian perspective. You've just been so generous sharing your wisdom, your insights, uh, your considered opinions uh, with us. It's been a real gift to our audience. So on behalf of the Monk membership, I just want to extend our, our heartfelt thanks. 
It's been such a pleasure, uh, Roger, to be with you and to be with members of the Muck community. I guess you and I would both say uh, that we hope we can see uh, as many members in person in 2021 as possible. Yeah, we really hope maybe fall 2021, we can be back at Roy Thompson Hall for a big debate yeah, right. to think up the resolution. <laughs> Thanks, Janice. Uh, well, yeah. look, that, uh, that wraps up, ladies and gentlemen, officially uh, this 2020 season for uh, the Monk Dialogues. I want to remind you, Monk members, that uh, for really the first time uh, in the history of our organization, 10 plus years, we're offering uh, gift memberships. So if you've got a family member, a friend who loves to debate across uh, the proverbial table, maybe on those Zoom calls you're having, well, we've got the perfect gift for you. Lots of great perks, access to our 10 plus year online archive of debates and high definition video, advanced ticketing privileges for our live and online events. We have some great members only online events coming up early in 2021. Uh, your giftee gets to pick a Monk Debate book of their choice and you get a charitable tax receipt if you're a Canadian resident as the gifts purchaser. You can do all that on our website, www.monkdebates.com forward slash membership. And for sticking around to the end of the show, being part of our conversation, you get 30% off. Just use our promo code MONKGIFT2020 uh, to get 30% off our annual $99 annual membership, all valid until December 25th. So last minute shopping, we've got you covered. Hey, Monk members, uh, again, it's been a great year uh, with you, at least in the context of having these conversations. Uh, really appreciate your support for our organization and what we're about, civil and substantive dialogue on the big questions of the day. We'll see what 2021 brings, but uh, rest be sure we will be here doing interesting programming, exploring interesting ideas, and providing all that to you as a valued Monk member. I'm Rudyard Griffiths. Have a terrific holiday season. Be well, be safe. The very best wishes to you and yours for 2021. Good night.